if we can change topics for just a few moments, uh, we want to spend some time looking at uh, one of the uh, newer agents uh, to be approved in ovarian cancer, that is a, a PARP inhibitor, uh, Olaparib. And uh, Brad, you want to uh, give us a brief overview of the Olaparib data sure. up to this point? So Olaparib is an oral medication. It's a PARP inhibitor, as, as was said. Um, and there are kind of two ways to use it. So platinum sensitivity, that is responding to platinum over and over again, is a biomarker of BRCA dysfunction. And so those patients will respond a second or a third time, let's say, and then you can use it as a maintenance drug. And, and some people say, well, that's the study 19 approach, because study 19 was in the New England Journal. And that's not the indication. It is the indication in Europe, Europe but not, not here. here. The indication here is to intervene with patients with measurable disease fourth line and beyond. So having failed three prior regimens, and, and this is now under accelerated approval in the United States because it was based on a single arm phase two trial of 137 patients. And in those 137 patients, the response rate was 34%. Again, this is after failing at least three prior regimens, 34%. You say, well, that's not that great. Well, in this, after failing three regimens, it is good. Mm -hmm. And the duration of response was 7.9 months. So the response rates were intriguing, the duration was really good, eight months, and that's how they got accelerated approval. So there's kind of two ways to use it. Platinum sensitive relapse maintenance, which is the European label. Our label is a therapeutic in BRCA germline mutation patients. Again, companion diagnostic. If you're BRCA positive, you've had three lines, go on a lap route. All right, well, what, the question that is hanging out there is are there patients other than BRCA positive patients who might be candidates for PARP inhibitors? And, and we talked about sort of the, the panels, the panels that have homologous recombination repair involved genes that might predict that. Now that would be off label. Um, we also talked about platinum sensitive as a, as a surrogate biomarker for BRCA dysfunction. So, so yes is the answer, but again, that would be off label. Yeah, and I think we had early, early um, hints of this because, you know, uh, um, there was a uh, phase two study that was done by, by Gelman and that basically showed that in the BRCA wild type negatives, there was a response rate to laparib, 24%. Right. So, and I think, you know, now that we've gotten better at understanding and looking into what BRCA, what it means to be a germline negative, but a positive responder to, uh, to a partner here, basically suggests that there are other genes for which the idea of synthetic lethality that Brad discussed um, is, re is a relevant concept for tumor kill, tumor yeah. cell kill. And, and Tate, so the, the short answer though is no, that as the current label stands, it has to be a germline BRCA mutation. The longer answer is that everyone has, has been talking about the HRG genes, uh, HRD genes of which there's at least 13, including RAD51, yeah. CND, you have the, the check one and two, you have the FAMS, you have ATM, BARD, it goes yeah. on and on. But uh, um, those are all in the future. Uh, and some of the PARP inhibitors have incorporated that into their development program, so we'll probably see that as part of the label as we move forward. Uh -huh. All right, and uh, when you start at a Laparib, how long do you continue it? Well, you know, you, the label is until progression, right. but, but there's, there's basically two reasons to come off, not only progression but toxicity. Sure. So the toxicities associated with the Laparib uh, are some bone marrow suppression, which is minor, generally anemia, mm -hmm. But the Achilles heel is GI toxicity, mm -hmm. so the dyspepsia, the nausea, um, and then the diarrhea. So we, we I have, in, you know, have a, an experience of being proactive in supportive care, treating everyone with the protonics or an H2 blocker for the dyspepsia, yep. and having patients in their possess possession supportive medications for the diarrhea and the nausea, so on Dancitron or Loperamide or mm -hmm. both. Mm -hmm. And, and then sometimes they need dose reduction. So how long do I treat them? I treat them until they progress or until they have symptoms that I can't handle, but hopefully I can handle the symptoms. Right, and many of those symptoms, you know, happen in cycle one. And right. Many of them get better with, That's exactly uh, with those right. types of things. So, so I, I'm a, I completely agree with you um, that we prep these patients ahead of time for the, so that they to manage the expectations, so they understand that this is going to happen, and not to freak out about it. So that they can, and they have a, an array of, of things that they can try, and we have access because you coach them through the first cycle. Then and I think we do, can get. Do them you going. prescribe antiemetics yeah. as well? Yeah, I, get, yeah. I definitely do. Yeah. And the the, so the worst in the first cycle on the label, it says you know forty percent or so have dose discontinuations or dose delays. Yeah. that's what we're talking about because right. that's an, another strategy mm -hmm. for mitigation of toxicity. 
but the number of discontinuations to, to adverse events was less than 10%. Right. So and I, th I think you can even have fewer dose delays and dose continuations with, than, that, kind of with that sort of strategy. I agree, totally. And, the, and the, the, the discontinuation should be very low. Yeah. Okay, so we've, we've talked about PARP inhibitors uh, as uh, single agents uh, in uh, the maintenance and in subsequent lines uh -huh. of therapy. Um, is there anything interesting going on in combining a, a PARP inhibitors with other biologic agents or with chemotherapy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's been several studies evaluating the mm -hmm. addition of PARP inhibitors with a variety of different chemotherapeutic agents, some of them showing um, promising activity, some showing no difference in activity compared to chemotherapy alone. So I think it really depends what type of chemotherapy you add these drugs to. Um, the um, area that I'm very interested in is combining PARP inhibitors with biologic therapies, such That's as right. anti-angiogenic agents. There's a thought of that if you increase hypoxia, there may be a synergistic effect with the PARP inhibitor, and PARP inhibitors combined with immunotherapies. All right, is there an example of a combination of a biological agent and a PARP inhibitor? Absolutely, there was a data presented here last year from Dr. Liu that was very interesting, evaluating the combination of sidirinib and alaparib compared to alaparib only. And in the entire population, there was a 17.7 month progression-free survival seen in women with um, recurrent That's ovarian good, cancer right? compared mm -hmm. to nine months. Yes, it was really interesting 18 months. Makes you think about it mm -hmm. in the context of chemo, right? Anti-VEGF, yeah. we just spent, talked about right. it, and PARP. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like it. So what's mm -hmm. really exciting is that the data from that has been used to inform uh, two future trials in energy. So one is a phase three study of the combination of sidirinib and alaparib in women with platinum sensitive ovarian cancer, comparing that to standard of care uh, chemotherapy. And then the other is a phase two, three study of the combination compared to standard of care theme chemotherapies versus elaborate alone. And I should say... In a platinum, platinum resistance. Platinum, platinum resistance group, yeah. yes. Is that pick the winner between mm -hmm. the and two? And the elaborate only arm is also being evaluated in the platinum sensitive group too. So uh, it's a very exciting time and there's many translational endpoints. There's integrated um, endpoints as well as integral um, biomarkers in the phase three study in platinum sensitive disease. And, and there could be some unique toxicities, right? We, she yeah. she yeah, reported absolutely. this year some two rotator cuff uh, yeah, discontinuations, which is interesting that they hadn't seen that with either of the other drug development yeah, programs for in either individual drug. So I think that you know the, the point you're bringing up, and I think it's it's excellent, is that the it, it's a it's a new setting that we call contextual synthetic lethality. In other words, you change the context, and it, it, it changes the situation where you don't see synthetic lethality, and you and you promote a synthetic synthetic lethality phenotype. And so hypoxia is one, but there's many others, and as you mentioned. So the immune uh, checkpoint inhibitors is probably another one. There's also um, p53 abrogation that might be a, um, uh, another uh, c contextual um, element that can be done. So I think that as we learn more about what what actually sensitizes these cells to this type of of um, mechanism of action, we're, it's going to expand quite quite a lot. So at this meeting, right? So in colorectal cancer, uh -huh. in, in, in patients who had mismatch repair gene mutations, yes. Yes. there was extreme activity of PD-1. Yeah. So, so you said it, so what, that same concept should work with HRD and Elaprib or some other PARP inhibitor and PD-1. And, and the beauty of it is, is that the company that makes Elaprib also makes a PD-L1, yeah. and you talked about P53, they also make a WE1 inhibitor that interacts with P53. So I, I think the future here is combinations that don't include cytotoxic chemotherapy. It's still chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that's that's really what's exciting, and and, and but but managing the toxicities because right. you said that there might be some unique ones. So and, and think about even expanding further, right? What do we know about microsatellite instability in GYN? Right. Endometrial cancer. Right. And our hypermuters, hypermutators. So we've got. It's fun. Yeah. It's good stuff to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then uh, is one last uh, question on the PARP inhibitors. Yeah. Uh, what we've been talking about up to this point uh, are data generated primarily in the Cirrus. Uh, population. What about uh, use of PARP inhibitors in non serous Sure. Ovarian slash fallopian tube slash peritoneal cancer. <laughs> <or something. laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, I think that we're starting to understand that somatic mutation of BRCA can occur in other types. So we, we have seen that. Um, and uh, so we see it in an ametroid. We've actually seen it in clear cell. And actually, there's a PARP inhibitor that we didn't talk about here yet, um, Rucaparib, which so there's a large phase two um, um, report that's going to be um, done that um, basically shows that, um, that we see a very similar type of robust activity in three different buckets of patients. The, the, the somatic 
and germline mutate right. BRCA population. Same, very similar. Similar activity. A group that are wild type for both, and then a middle group which has loss of heterozygosity. And so the, the loss of heterozygosity germline or BRCA neg mutation negative group represents some of the people that we were just, some of the other tumor types that we're talking about, these hypermutators, the MSIs, um, and in that case, other mutations in the HRD pathway and methylation. that are p potentially sensitive. So to teach this. our audience. So remember, we said that 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 BRCA repairs DNA, okay, mm -hmm. uh, double-stranded DNA breaks mm -hmm. through homologous recombination repair deficiency. And, and you can measure DNA breaks, it's called LOH. Mm -hmm. So if you see a genome that has lots of DNA breaks, then they probably have deficient HRD, and that can be a surrogate evaluation of PARP sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's, it's kind of a neat surrogate biomarker. Right. I think the new terminology for that is genomic scarring. Right. Yeah, what does that mean? But I, but I like HRD, but but it, it is genetic well, scarring. It, but, think, but that's good, Angelus. That's what they call it. The point it. is that that's it's true. It may not just be homologous recombination deficiency. It's just a, a lock of hypermutable situation. Yeah, that's that, a good point. 